Welcome back everyone to the Python tutorial seminar series. Today, Austin Kutz will be covering object-oriented programming and I'll hand it over to him in a second. But before I do that, uh, we need to review the code of conduct. So by joining the Zoom call and participating in the tutorial seminar series, you've agreed to adopt these values and engage in respectful communication only. Any inappropriate remarks will have you removed from the chat. Uh, in the chat, we'll have you removed from the call. Seminar is only an hour long, so we will do our best to help you out in the chat, uh, but some, some problems might take some uh, more time and some more individualized attention. So please just sit back and relax. And remember, it's only an hour and we'll get you up to speed afterwards. Here are some learning resources we'd like to direct you to. Uh, so as always, Python documentation and Stack Overflow are great uh, tools to learn more. And we'll be using Jupyter today. And uh, the content is all posted on a GitHub repository hosted by Austin, which I will post in the chat here again, just in case anyone joined after Austin posted it. And with that, I will hand it over to Austin. Okay, the control panel jumped behind a window. There we go. Everyone can see my screen and can see and hear me. If not, scream in the chat really loudly. Um, so first thing we're gonna do is we're going to have everyone go to the directory at which they want to clone the GitHub repo. Um, under I'm doing it under my projects directory. And you're gonna start by running git clone on the um, link provided in chat github.com pilot shoot OOP HRRR tutorial. This will give us some files we're going to need to get our Conda environments ready for the tutorial. Uh, the first 10 minutes or so of this tutorial will be getting everyone um, with their Conda environments built and their environments cloned. I do not need to clone this tutorial, this um, repository because it already exists on my computer, but I have shown you the command to do so. Once you have cloned that repo, um, you're going to change directory into it. Uh, you're, you can see just, I'm in my projects in the tutorial directory. Um, from there, um, we will start building our Conda environment where there's an environment file in the tutorial that we'll be using to create a tutorial environment. Sure thing. If this was a, an EVE Online fleet, I'd have everyone just put X's in chat when you've got this uh, step accomplished. Um, just a few of you when you do complete the uh, cloning, if you'd put an X in, in chat so that I know that people are reaching completion. Groovy, thank you so much. All right, so now we're going to use Conda, which you should have. Now my Conda is a mini Conda installation. So you can see here, um, I'm using a mini Conda install that's local to my machine. Uh, you probably have some version of Conda installed on yours. So what we're gonna do is we're going to Conda environment create dash F. And then we can see here that we have this environment file, environment.yaml. We're just gonna use that environment.yaml to create our Conda environment. Um, so, that is what we're running, that command there, conda env create environment.yaml. I'm going to copy and paste that into the chat. Now, I did nuke my entire conda environment for the tutorial so I could rebuild it with you all. So um, that way I won't go too far ahead of you.
If you have any questions about what we're about to cover, um, a, a .yaml file, that is a data exchange format that's supposed to be human readable and is also fairly interoperable with JSON or JSON. Um, well, you misspelled environment. It's not environment, it's environment. This is why I only ever type the first three letters and then tab it out. <laughs> um, because my, I was gonna say my penmanship, but it's not quite that. Oh, if it's, if it's misspelled the instructions, then do what I do and not what the instructions say. Um, I will make equally as many mistakes, but I'll be correcting mine on the fly. All right, so as you can see, my Conda environment has been created. So all you're gonna to wanna to do is next is you're gonna to wanna to activate that environment. Uh, Conda provides that activation command for you. And then you'll see that your Conda environment changes to OOP tutorial. Once we have that, we're gonna hop straight into our Jupyter lab. So that's just Jupyter space lab. And that'll open up a tab in your preferred browser. And I'm going to wait for some people to put the letter Y in chat saying that they are caught up with an open Jupyter lab tab on their browser. And once a few people have done that, I'm going to assume that everyone has, and then I'm going to cover up this terminal window with my Jupyter lab screen. Cool. Um, I probably need to make this way bigger. So what we're gonna do here is we're going to, first we're gonna open up the objects notebook. Um, so that'll be here on the left-hand side of your file browser. Um, it's this file tab, it can collapse. So just double click on that and that'll open it up. And then I'm going to minimize the file tab so that I actually have some screen space. And I'm going to make it just back down to 200% as big as it should be. Um, if anyone can't read it, just let me know in chat. I have scaled the text to an unreasonable size, but I know exactly how unreasonable it has to be um, for Zoom to actually send text. Okay, um, this is the UCAR to train, train material I put together for you guys, uh, you people. And um, I was gonna show a motivational example right at the top, but um, that would be doing things out of order. What we're first gonna do is we're gonna talk very specifically and with very precise language about what objects are and how they differ from code you generally see, uh, especially in a kind of off the cuff, getting a plot out or doing quick analysis on data context. Um, so what are objects? Um, classes in Python are objects. That's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the one on one. Uh, Python is technically a language where almost everything is an object, um, but huge exception here, not everything behaves like a traditional object. Um, I've harped about this before, uh, if you attended the NumPy tutorial, um, but objects have certain useful features that are not generally available with other data structures. Um, and we'll get into how they work in Python and, and what, what their usefulness is. Um, so first, let's go over these terms. Now I'm gonna to try to use these terms precisely if I slip up because sometimes I get casual. Uh, just let me know in chat if I was unclear about something, um, but I will try to use the correct terms for the duration of the lecture so that no one gets confused um, and so that I don't misspeak about what something does or is. All right, so the first thing we're going to talk about is a function. This is the traditional Python code you generally see. Uh, functions are blocks of code meant to be reused. Um, they usually take an input and they usually return an output. Um, I define a function named function here in block four. And as you can see, um, there is no like persistent data held by that function. Um, the input is turned into output and the output is returned but there, the input is not modified, crucially, and the output is typically brand new data, right? It doesn't, current, it doesn't previously exist 
in allocated space in your Python memory stack. Um, it's just it's it's new data with a new pointer to a new piece of allocated memory, and it's brand new as of the closing of the function as of, as of when it returns. Um, an object, on the other hand, is a data structure designed to be persistent and be reused and be modified. So a class in Python is an object. I have created a class called object. Um, classes names in PEP8 are generally started with a uppercase character. You'll notice that functions are all lowercase and classes or objects are generally started um, with an uppercase letter. This is a PEP8 standard. It helps people understand kind of from context clues what you're talking about when you reference an object, whether you're referencing a function definition or an object itself or a method of an object, say. Um, objects contain data. Um, they are a data structure at heart. And th that data is often referred to as a property of the object. Um, for this class object, we are defining this property as a string, some value that exists before instantiation. Um, this property being assigned prior to and without the invocation of the init block is called a static property. It exists as part of the class in Python's class memory structure, but it does not require an instantiation of that class to be accessed. And if you access it from the class and not from instantiation of that class, it will return the value that is static, this some value that exists before instantiation. Now, classes have two types of methods. There are methods that are generally considered implicit and are called by other functions. You'll find classes that have um, implicit methods like length or to string or value of. Those implicit methods are generally defined by starting with two underscores in the PEP8 standard. Now, the most important implicit method that generally will be overwritten by someone creating an object is called the init block. That is the implicit method that is called when an object is created. So when you create an object, you have the option of passing in some value to that object when it is created or some sets of values, some arguments, if you will. And that will inform the properties of that object or allow the object to be created in such a way that it's immediately useful. For this simplified example, we are not passing in any arguments to the instantiator of the class, that is this init method, this init block. Um, we are simply passing in the object reference to the object itself using the self keyword. The self keyword does not appear to the end user of your object. Um, it merely exists for um, a way of, of referencing the object's data structure from within a function, within a method of the object. Um, sorry, I was reading the chat real quick. Um, if that is not clear, and it might not be because this is a, like a mental exercise. Um, we'll, we'll cover this in more detail when we actually use objects um, on real weather data that I pulled literally 30 minutes ago um, for the remainder of the tutorial once you get through this definition section. The second type of method is generally unique to an object. It's not an implicit method. It is something defined by us to talk about our method with now, or, or talk about our object with. Now, for our simplified class object here that we're using for the demo. We are defining a method that takes in a new value for the property and sets the property equal to that new value. Um, this is how classes generally interact with uh, the user and how the user interacts with classes is that a user will have an object or data structure that has the data they want to manipulate and they will call a method on that object. That method will modify the object in a way that the user wants it to be modified. The user does not have to immediately access that data later. They don't have to have an equals returns value, right? They can just modify their object and then reference that modified value but through the object later without having to handle a bunch of um, label and reassignments of the underlying data structure, which is why objects are very useful. You can wrap a lot more functionality in methods and we'll show that later on today. Let's use this object we've just created. So everyone in your objects notebook, run self, um, yeah, run self four. 
to get your uh, object loaded into memory, and then run cell five, and then we'll look at the output together. Now, what we're doing in, in this cell is the first thing we're doing is we're referencing object.property. Now you can see that we're referencing capital O object. That means we are referencing the class of object, not an instantiation, and we're referencing the property, which means as we talked about before, we are going to be referencing that static value of the property, which is some value that ex exists before instantiation. And we can see that our first printed line is some value that exists before instantiation. So that has executed the way we expect it to. The next thing we do is we create an instance of that object. We are calling this instance, instance one. You're gonna have multiple instances of any object. Each instance is unique and separable um, and doesn't overlap with any other reference to that object. So we are creating instance one, which is its own instantiation of this data structure. Now you'll notice we pass no arguments in, but because the init method is implicitly called, i.e. it's called in the background as part of the Python language, and it only has the value self, which is hidden from the end user, we don't have to pass in anything and we actually shouldn't pass in anything. So the object signature for creating an instance of the object is just this. Now we're going to print the instances property. So we, we reference the property of instance one by the name of instance one dot property, just like we do with the object class and we would get some value that exists after instantiation. So we see that by just simply creating an instance of the object, we're able to have that value pro sign to the property change. Now, if we instantiate it with a given value, this would be the given value. But in this case, since the implicit thing is to show you what it does, we've made it have just a describer that it does change. It's not the same as the class anymore because it's been instantiated. Um, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to modify our object. So we reference our instance of the object, instance one. We call instance one's method using dot method, and we pass in the argument. We have now changed the property. So the method takes a new property value and swaps the, the property value of the object out for that new value. That's all we're doing here. And then when we print that, when we print instance one's property now, we have now changed the property as we told it to. Um, and then to prove that we haven't done anything wonky to the object class, I just reprint out the class object static property and we see that it remains some value that exists before instantiation. Um, this shows like exactly how um, separable objects are and how you can use them to contain and modify data without having to worry about the safety or or the long-term um, fidelity of that data. Because only changes you make to an object matter and you can always reinstantiate an object. So let's get into the weeds right away and let's start using an object. Um, well, actually, let me show you how not to do a thing first. Let's show you what we can make better. I would like everyone to open up their no objects notebook. We are going to create a plot using the data that you've downloaded as part of the GitHub repository. And we're going to make that plot without using any objects, at least without defining any objects for ourselves. So everyone open up the no objects Python notebook and then run the imports for me. Those might take a second, um, but they should all be there in your kernel. Now, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be uh, don't modify anything of the no objects file. It's not intended to be modified. So please don't mess around with like the latitude and longitude and stuff. Um, I dropped in the approximate degree coordinates of the NCAR lab that I work at. Um, not that I'm there right now, <laughs> but um, you'll, you'll get the weather for where I'm at for today when we do this, as we finish this up. So what we're doing here is we're going to pull, pull, um, the data from the NCEPS 2.5 kilometer high resolution rapid refresh model. And we are going to make some plots of our weather at hourly intervals throughout the day. Um, so the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna define our location and our bounds. So in block two, we're defining our latitude, our longitude, our north, south, east, and west bounds. We are defining the set of variables we want to pull from our weather data set from using Siphon. Um, 
And then we are going to, in block three, we are going, we would, if it were not commented out, and do not comment this out, please. Do not comment this out, or do not uncomment it. Leave it commented. Um, we are going to load the data set, which I have made fresh for you as of an hour ago. Um, that's this NC4 data format. It's a NetCDF4 file containing all of the data already requested. But if you wanted to uncomment this, this would actually work, and it would pull the query um, using Siphon. So we're going to run two and we're going to run three. And that should have NC loaded into our memory. Um, and then we are going to set up some index values, um, some time values. We're going to set up whether we want bar or streamlines. We're going to set a grid size. We set the, the time variable we want to look at. We're going to check our uh, set up our data conversions. We're going to create a, you don't have to worry about this. We haven't covered Cardify yet. Um, we're setting up just a, a distortion on our on our grid of data so that like when we map it, it maps correctly and doesn't look weird. <laughs> um, this is just a, a basically a limit for formal projection of our data because it's modeled on a Lambert conformal grid when it's built by ANSET. Um, we're going to set up our plot, our axes. I'm just going through this. We're not actually going to evaluate what it does. I'm just showing you this is what it looks like if you're just making a plot really quick. And you can see how much like writing you would have to do to get a single plot here. And this is a plot of something. Um, I don't think I'm even supplying the, the title. We're getting a plot of what looks like, I don't even know, temperature or upward vertical velocity at the lowest 40, 400 um, hectopascals or something. Anyway, you get, you, you can make a plot, but to do that plot, you have like, pages of text that you would have to write out for every plot. Now, if I'm doing weather predictions from a paragliding club, I do not want to run pages of text in a Jupyter notebook every time, because if I want to modify something, I want to modify it quickly. I want it to just do things. So the correct way of doing something like this in an object-oriented way is, of course, in our objects file. So we're going to go back to our objects notebook, objects.pynotebook, and we're going to scroll down to where we do this in an object-oriented fashion. And then I'm going to go through what we've just done and how we can make that into like a logically structured object that anyone can use. And at this point, um, don't uncomment anything yet, but if we have time at the end of the lecture, I will have you uncomment it and put in your own locations approximately. And you can like see plots of where you live, of what your weather is gonna be today. Um, so in, in this block here, I don't have the block numbers anymore because I've run things out of order. Um, we're going to do our imparts. We're importing the same things. We're importing Cardify, Matplotlib, NumPy, Siphon, X-Array, and time, because uh, we always need more time. And we're going to define the class. Now, again, PEP8 standard says that classes should start with a capital letter, which is fine by me, because I'm going to be using um, the acronym HRRRCAST, which high resolution, rapid refresh. And then I'm just going to call it like forecast. We don't want to write forecast every time. So this is just the cast object. Um, and we're creating our implicit method. Now you'll notice that this Im implicit uh, instantiation method has that self argument from before, but we are also gonna pass in a latitude and longitude coordinates. That allows anyone who's using the object later, if it's not me, if it's some other club for paragliding on the West Coast or on the East Coast or somewhere else in the world, um, although they won't have the HRR model available to them, so good luck. Um, to put in their own coordinates for where their launch site is at and get the weather for them. Uh, I, I don't have to modify their code. They just instantiate the object with their location and boom, they get their data uh, for them. So we pass in latitude and longitude and we use those to inform the bounds um, just like we did before. Um, we set up a couple of other things like we set up the latest access URL so that this way we can keep track of like, have we already pulled this data? And if we have, and this object already has this data loaded, we don't really need to repull it. We can just like, hey, guy, it's already in memory. Let's let's keep running and run, make more plots. Um, we also set up this NC. This is our data structure. So later on, we'll reference this NC a lot. Um, but for now, we're setting it to zero because we haven't pulled any data. We haven't imported anything. This is this is just the instantiated object that does really hasn't done anything yet. Um, so that's our initiation method for this HRRR cast object. 
And then I'm defining an update method. Now, again, we have commented a lot of this out and that's okay. Um, what we have commented out is the siphon access. It takes some of the data, the, some of the properties for the objects we've already defined and passes those in to a, a, a siphon query so that siphon will return the data set you want. Um, we take that data set as a raw set of bytes. We stream that into a net CDF four file and implicitly open and close it. And then once that file has been created, we then load the data set. Now the data set already exists in our, in our um, GitHub repo. So you do not need to run those steps. When we run update, we are simply just loading from our local file. We are using load data rather than open data set. Uh, because load data set also implicitly closes the file after it has read the data into memory, while open data set is lazy and does not load any data. It just opens the file. And then when you request the data later, it will pull it. Um, I don't want to mess around with that. I usually just load data set because I work on machines with lots of memory. Hopefully that doesn't cause any problems for anybody. It only takes up about 300 megabytes, so it should be fine. You can add or subtract attributes later on, uh, Seth. There is no requirement to provide any project pro object properties in the init method. There is no requirement at all. Anytime you have access to the self reference uh, inside any method, you can add um, properties to an object. So you can, you, can, you can save computing an object property for later if you want to. So you can init an empty object and then have some compute method later that will then compute some value and then add that to the object as a property. That's no problem. And it's used a lot actually for lazy compute. Um, part of what we're doing with our data set is we are creating a bunch of derived values that are more useful to us. Um, I could care less what the uh, U velocity of wind at Wonderland Ridge here in Boulder is, but I care very much what the total wind speed is. So I derive the wind speed and wind energy for the local hill um, from the raw lat lawn data coordinates um, in my data set. And then we get to the meat and potatoes, the forecast object. This is what I use to create the plots. So rather than having to write out how to make a complicated matplotlib plot every single time, I create a plotting object. So I can call forecast on my HRR cast object and I can pass in the variable name I want it to forecast, um, the variable index, if any, uh, whether or not I want it to use barbs uh, or streamlines or what the grid size should be or which hour I want to look at, in fact. So I can specify by a time rather than by like time step three, I can just say, hey, see if this hour is in your data set. And if this hour is in the data set, show it to me. So I can ask for like 1900 GMT, solar noon here in Boulder. And I can get solar noon data for the, for the flying hill right off the bat with no messing around, uh, looking to figure out which, which time step in my data set is 1900 GMT. Uh, I don't want to do that for every plot I make. And then we can be kind of creative about how we turn those user provided values into useful things for plotting later on. So I make sure I'm either given a variable name or a variable index so I can look up the variable in my um, and CDF four data set. And then I save my variable name out into a nice short, short name. So I have to call like lots of brackets all the time. Um, I reference my wind speed a lot for making barbs or streamlines. So I save those out into easy to use names. Um, I'm going to be using a, a, the time index for the variable and the time index for my wind data may not be the same. Um, depending on the thing I'm looking at in the simulation, if I'm looking at like an accumulated precipitation part of the model, um, that accumulated precipitation has to wait an hour before it has a value. So there's no hour zero value for my accumulated precipitation. Wind speed is just a measurement or a predicted measurement, and that's available at any given data point. So there's actually more data in my NC wind time than in my NC bar time. So once I pull out those dimensions, I actually need to make sure that they're on the same hour. So I do that later. So I save those out as their own like time variable dimension information that I will reference again later. Um, I store out the NC variable name. 
Um, I store out the type of, of color map I want. I always want cool warm because that's what I've gotten used to handing out to people. But like you can pick any any um, color map from Matplotlib's tools. Um, you can set a center for your diverging color map, which we set to zero by default. And then we don't have mins and maxes by default, but we, we can set them and we will use them if we set them. So like if I'm looking at thermal instability, like I want to know if the day is going to be banging or it's going to be a, a dud, I can set my thermal instability boundaries. I can set my wind speed gust values. Paragliding, our, high, our top speeds are kind of low. Um, if the wind is gusting at 20, 20 meters per second, I am not going out that day. Um, and if it's above gusts of like five meters a second, I'll be like taking a second look at things because five meters a second is pretty darn brisk. Um, it could theoretically pluck me off my wing um, on launch if I'm not being careful. Same thing for wind speed at, at 10 meters, wind speed at 80 meters. Um, I set some reasonable values for very complex derived products. <laughs> um, some like, you know, cloud cover over the atmosphere. If it's more than 50% cloudy, I want to know. I really want to know because then the solar heating is going to be not good and then my flights are going to be not very thermic. I want to know if there's going to be a thunderstorm. So I, I look at the Cape ratios. And then I want to know if the day is going to be a scorcher. Like, do I need to bring lots of water or just a little bit of water? Um, so I can set those to what look like unreasonable values until you realize they're in Kelvin and then they make a lot of sense. So like if it's 10 Celsius out or whatever that is in Fahrenheit, I think 50 something, um, then it's a nice day. And if it's like, what, that's 30 Celsius or like 100 Fahrenheit, then that's a scorcher. And if it's like really cold, like 10 below freezing, I want to know that too. Um, some variables have different time arrays. I mentioned that. So we go through and we set the user requested hour to a string. And then we go through both of our indexes and make sure we found that index, that, 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 that time hour data in both of our indexes, both for our wind speed, which we're using for barbs or for streamlines, and in the data set that the user requested to plot out for color. Um, and once we found, if we found, if we find both of them, then we're good. If not, we have this guard statement, which says, you know, that time isn't in the data set. We're not going to print anything out, uh, which means that I can just request the full day. I know there's only 18 hours in my data set, but I can look at the full day and just get four, hey, time's not there. And it just keeps going. It'll keep going and do the next hour for me. So I don't have to worry about it glitching out or breaking things. Again, same kind of distortion mapping to the Lambert conformal projection, which is just straight up. We, we pull um, our grid data out of our NetCDF4 data format and pass our grid data into a Lambert conformal projection. And that does our, our transform for us. And then we pass that transform into our plots later. And Bob, Bob's your uncle, Danny's your aunt. You're all good to go. Um, we create a figure. We create axes. We set up our plot limits. We set up our mesh color. This is where we use our oops, wow. This is where we use our our center, min, and max values that we were talking about for specific data sets. Um, I add two locations to my plots. I add a dot and some text describing. Wonderland Lake launch point and the lookout launch point down in Golden, Colorado, uh, right on the edge of Denver. Um, there are other towns that are referenced by us when we're doing like cross country trips, like catching thermals and keep going. Um, but I didn't want to clutter up the plot too much and feel free to put in your own house, place of work, favorite running track, uh, GPS coordinates into the end of these blocks and, and give them a name. And that way you can have like some data points on your plot, giving you some context of where you're actually at. And then we draw our grid lines. We set up our, our X and Y labels. We arrange our grids. We plot our color bar off to the right-hand side. We make it so it's not too tall. Um, put a title up there based off of the variable time user requested and the variable name, which in the variable name to like not too long. <laughs> to exist and be real. Um, and then, um, well, we trim the time to get rid of all of the, the trailing seconds and minutes because it's always the top of the hour in the data set. And then we trim the name to not be more than 42 characters in length because otherwise the names just get ridiculous. And now I'm going to do run this cell. So I'm just going to go up to the top here and I'm going to run this cell to load that object into memory. And then I'm going to create that object. 
I'm going to call my HRRR cast object. I'm going to call it HR just to save me some typing. Yes, both update and forecast in this example are methods, not functions. Nope, I developed it inside of the object. It's really easy. It's no different than running any other Python file. You just reload that cell and keep going. Um, it, there's, there, it doesn't hide from your anything, from your debuggers or whatnot. Yeah, I haven't noticed any more difficulty in, in debugging an object than in a raw script. In fact, a raw script for me is harder um, because an object, the code only exists once in a raw script. I might have copied that code multiple times to make multiple plots, at which point if I make any changes, I have to make multiple changes. Yes, the init method is called implicitly. So this HRR cast, I'm passing in my latitude and my longitude. And if we scroll up to our init method, we see that those are part of the init methods implicit arguments. So this init method kind of maps like this into like here, where if you were to define the object, it would kind of appear as though we're part of the object definition. Um, this is the way Python handles it. It can be a little bit confusing if you're coming from something like, like Java, for example, um, where you define an object's creation method by just the name of the object as a method uh, with the appropriate creation arguments where you can call super and other versions of it and overload it and stuff. But in Python, you use the implicit init method and just only one of them, you can't overload it, unfortunately. Every object has an init method. You don't have to create one. If you don't create one, it's just empty and calls basically super.init, which could be empty or could not be init empty if you inherited from another object. We have not covered object inheritance in this class. Um, there just isn't really a place for it in the in this in the way in the way it was presented. Um, if at some point you have questions about object inheritance, please just email me. I'll be happy to explain it. And maybe we have sometime when the schedule allows, we might have like a advanced computing object concepts objects to through like factory methods and just talk about like the things you'd see at higher level CS courses. Um, code structure kind of things, the object inheritance, factory methods, all kinds of things like that, that come into being when you're doing like industrial scale software projects that aren't really relevant to personal data management and personal data analysis. Yeah, yeah, before we run the thing, um, I'll, I'll talk about that RSOTO. Um, we have basically the same thing. We have an object that is created within this in init method. The init method is slightly different and does take two arguments, latitude and longitude, as opposed to being empty. Um, we then have a couple of methods. In this case, instead of like setting a property to some value we assign, we tell it to update, where it uses properties that already exist to create more properties, the NC object, um, and load those into memory. And then we have a forecast method, which has a lot of arguments or a lot of optional arguments that we can then call to um, make that object produce images. Um, but we only have to call one line rather than copy a whole bunch of them. And because we have so many optional arguments, we either take what it gives us by default or we set up some values we want. Um, that really depends on the language, uh, Negan. In, in Python, it doesn't really matter. In Python, it's kind of nice to have all of your objects in one file, because um, then you can import from that Python module um, whatever objects you want, or import the whole module. Um, importing in the correct order costs multiple um, files for objects. If objects rely on other objects, can be tricky. But in Python, if it's all in one file, it reads top to bottom. Um, in Java, that's an entirely different story, but we are we are doing the tutorial in Python, so I'll stick to the Pythonic. Put the objects that use each other either in the same file or in the same directory to make it easier. Um, and be careful about import loops, because you can have an object that imports another object that imports itself, and you can go around in circles and your Python interpreter is not going to like that at all. Um, so We've created our object HR. We are then going to call ob update on this HR object. And then we are going to print our data set. Um, so we update it and that's 
just reading in the temp4 dot, uh, dot nc file or temp dot nc4 file. And then that provides our data set. We just print that out here. So we have a certain number of dimensions, um, our height above ground, height above ground three, isobaric, isobaric layer, pressure difference layer, time, et cetera. Um, and those are what we have for our dimensions. And then our coordinates are here as well. So we can look at our pressure difference layers, our times, our heights. Then we've got data variables. Um, and those have the coordinates defined here. So our pressure reduced surface, pressure reduced MSL value, for example, um, that is defined as an X, Y thing and time. It's a 2D data set. But we have other data sets that are, um, say, hourly maximum pressure of uh, uh, vertical velocity or um, surface lifted index. And we, we and then those have like multiple dimensions. Like you've got time, you've got the isobaric layer you're looking at, and then you've got X and Y. So you have to slice those up into 2D data sets before you can uh, display them. Um, and then there's a number of attributes for all of the things. And this is where we get our grid data, our geospatial lat long mins, um, and who gave it to us. So the National Weather Service Census for Environmental Prediction has this HRR 2.5 kilometer model. And then generally, I just run this block in the morning. Um, and that's the HR update. So that pulls new data. And then 4x in range. So I'm interested in like, what's it going to be around my lunch break? So I can drive to the hill, hike up the hill, take a quick flight, come back, and try to not miss any of my afternoon meetings. Um, I will make a forecast from 1800, which is um, noon here, but before solar noon, 1900, which is solar noon in the peak of heating for the day, which is usually the best flying, and like um, 20, uh, 100 hours, which is 2 p.m., and it's usually when my meetings pick up again in the evening or in the afternoon. Um, so I, I make three sets of four plots, wind speed, like is it blown out? Is it not blown out? Is it blowing east or is it blowing west? Because that matters because our, our fa site faces a certain way. Um, what's the vertical lift like? Do we have a convergence setting up behind the hills where it's going to be safe to fly? Or is the convergence on top of us or is it out like on the plains where it doesn't do us any good? Um, what's the thermal instability like? Are we going to have thermals or is it going to be like smooth like glass? And then what's the up? Like what's the next layer up's thermal instability? Is that is the is the um, Gulf the uh, sorry the jet stream is the jet stream going to mix down and turn our wind from light east to like crazy west at like two p.m. and make it really dangerous? So like let's look at our thermal stability of our atmosphere. Um, so we run that, and as you can see for each plot, I can not only generate it in a for loop, I can generate each set of plots in a for loop, but I only have to call like what I'm interested in. And in this case, I was like, this is a variable name I'm interested in. And this is the hour I'm interested in. What hour? Hour X. What is hour X? It's defined in my for loop. So like, I don't even have to write this line more than once. And I can produce these charts of wind speed for noon today. Let's see, it's currently 1.44 PM. So if we want to scroll down to our, what, 1900 to, 2,100 plots. So this, this is the wind speed about the time I started the talk today, uh, the predicted wind speed here at Wonderland Ridge and Boulder. Um, you can see we just had a bunch of snow. We probably have a lot of cloud cover, so we're not getting a lot of heating. And you can see the wind just isn't going anywhere. There's no wind to speak of. The wind we do have is, is slightly east on the plains from that iurnal cycle. We don't have any convergence to speak of. Um, weak updrafts along the top of the Rocky Mountains here, but it's not doing us any good. <laughs> not doing anyone any good. Our thermal instability, um, as you can see, we have like a layer of snow on the ground. So like our thermal instability is, is solid at the surface. Like it's it's hugely inverted. So it's very blue and not, not creating thermals. Behind the Rockies where there is no snow, um, on the other side of the Rockies where there is no snow, and it's higher altitude and pretty dry, and probably aren't very many clouds. Uh, it's getting lots of heating. So that's baking off over there. And down south near Pueblo, Colorado Springs, that's looking like a pretty nice day. Um, thermal instability above, above 10,000 feet to about 18,000 feet, that looks relatively stable. So we're not expecting the west winds um, above, the, above the divide to mix down to us. We're expecting to like remain pretty isolated 
in terms of the um, things creating our wind and allowing our wind to flow around. Um, and then later on in the day, wind stays zero for us. That convergence doesn't develop. The heat moves, the thermal instability close to the surface comes further north as things start to melt. Um, but it never does break that, that thermal inversion 10,000, 18,000 feet. Um, yeah. Is there any plots you got you, you all like to see? Like, do you want to see something like the cloud cover? Because I mentioned that, like, I think it's been a cloudy day. Um, do we want to take a look at the cloud cover for today? I think we should. I think it'd be interesting. Uh, self dot variable list HR entities. Um, so yeah, that up that line of the update method is just so this self variable here, which we define on the init, is the variables we're requesting from the remote data set hosted by NSET. And it's on the, uh, what is it, the threads data server. Um, we then add a bunch of things to that data set. So we want to regather our keys to that data set. So we've added a bunch of keys to this data set. So variable is no longer a complete list of our keys of our data set. So we are going to get our list of keys and then sort them and set them up so that they're alphabet alphabetized and they're all there. Um, Cause we're adding in one, two, three, four, eight, we're adding in eight keys. Um, and we're gonna go look for what was our cloud cover like today? So var name was total cloud cover. And what hour do we wanna look at? Um, what do you guys think? Uh, I haven't seen, let's look at 20 hundred. Let's look at 15 minutes from now. And I can just run that. That allows me to access the data in my forecast object and the um, chart producing method that is associated with it and see what my cloud cover looks like in 15 minutes because I made it object oriented and therefore I can call methods that take in my requests, use the data that exists in the object and produces the chart without me having to know much more than I kind of want to look at the cloud cover and maybe in 15 minutes. And then I can pass that into the object and that's it. I don't have to remember how to do barbs on my map plot live Glamour conformal array. I can just do it. I can just call it and it'll give it to me. And I can pass it to a friend who isn't computer literate or doesn't have an advanced degree in computer science. And they can just say, hey, thank you for the forecast object. This is the location I want, update it, and then call a forecast to see their cloud cover. They don't have to know how the object works. They just need to know that they can interact with it by calling update to get new data whenever they want new data and that they can If you define your class in a separate file, how do you import the packages you need for it? Um, you would import it just like you would any other Python module. Um, so Python structures are packages, which is like a directory, modules, which is a file, and functions or classes, which are in the file. So when I talk about a module, I'm referring to a Python file within a directory. If I refer to a package, I'm referring to a directory. And if I'm referring to like, a package with a capital P, I'm talking about like a, a set of directories that covers like a large Python package. Um, XR load data set, that's telling XRA to load the data set contained in the file temp nc4. Um, okay, so, um, what that does, that might actually be a typo on my part. Uh, sorry, um, Quinn Quinn. Um, that is probably a typo. I should be using in self.update. That should be self.nc.keys. Um, it works because we create the object named HR before we call update. So it uses the HR object reference from the uh, Python memory, but you, that you're right. That is a bug. That is not a feature um, that has been fixed. So you can replace uh, HR with self. In this case, it works 
And I had noticed it because I was always, it's just been me. And I've always been defining it as HR equals HRR cast. And so this HR value exists in my Python namespace before I call hr.update. So update can say, hey, this HR value is defined in the global namespace. I can just use that HR value, which points to the same object that if it was called on, so it all works out and it acts as though it was self. But if you were to define your HRR cast object with a different name, it would break. You are correct. That was that was a typo on my part. It's, it's been there for a couple of weeks. I haven't seen it. I mean, like I didn't notice it. Um, because like I had like said, how do, how do I get my keys to list out nicely? And I was like, okay, I need, you know, I need, I need to see my keys. So I was going like hr.nc.keys and it was giving me this, which wasn't terribly useful. Um, but then I could find that I could like do list of my nc.keys and that would cast this implicitly with the to list command that the dictionary object had and it would give me the list of keys I wanted. And then I just was like, okay, this line works. And then of course I dropped it into my object. Um, and that's how I got in there. But yes, it should have been self. Um, we have some time, about 10 minutes now. Um, and I would ask anyone who wants to, to go ahead and in their, um, in their object, uncomment these lines. So this self NC object, can, this one here can stay commented. That shouldn't be uncommented, but like the rest of them should be. And go ahead and uncomment it. There's Run a couple of questions in the chat. Yeah. Um, yes, yeah, self argument in class. It's only it's only mandatory. Well, technically never. It's never mandatory. It's just always useful. So and it always disappears. So always put it in. Um, you need to pass in self because Python is a little bit silly about how it reads code. And because classes are allowed to access things outside of their namespace, um, they're allowed to access the global namespace, you need to pass in self so that you have a reference to your current object. Um, otherwise, the self keyword wouldn't quite be sure whether it's referring to the object class or the object instance in my understanding. Uh, yeah, I, I do not know of a way of making class properties in Python um, access restrictive. So yeah, I think everything in a class in Python is public. In Java, you'll have things that are like protected or private. Um, you can uh, assign to a, a statically typed variable or strongly typed variable. So you can say, I have a private float of some scalar factor and then nothing outside of that object can see that part of the that, that property of the object it's hidden and you have to use getters and setters to modify it but in python i don't think you can hide object properties from public access uh self is i don't know enough about c plus plus objects to really make a, a comparison um, but yeah, it, 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 the self says, okay, when this is called on an object, you pass the object's reference to that method and then hide it. Yes. Uh, show how to fix the bug again. Okay. So the bug is in the update method. It is at the very bottom or almost to the bottom in self variable equals list. Um, the bug was that I had hr.nc.keys and that hr needs to be replaced with the keyword self. Um, because when I was developing it, I wasn't changing my object name because I only need to create one object for my data set, which is my local data set. Yes, yes, dhunt, I think that is correct. Yeah, Stack Overflow is, is where I do 90% of my work. <laughs> I come up against a problem and I'm like, okay, Stack Overflow, bail me out over here. And then I, I read about what Stack Overflow has to say. And then I see what parts of it are applicable to what I'm doing. And then I use the ideas that I learned there um, in whatever I'm writing. Okay, uh, five minutes remaining. Has anyone successfully gotten a plot of their local area? I really want to see someone do that. 
Yes. Google Foo is important. Has anyone like swapped in their location and gotten a gotten a plot? I don't know if there's a way for you guys for anyone to share it. Um, Yeah, yeah, if someone wants to like, I can stop presenting my screen since we've covered everything. And if someone wants to show me like, I don't know, some interesting weather around their place, that would be cool. Don't dox yourself though, like keep your keep your location crosshairs to like the nearest degree. Don't, don't give me your house location. I will stop sharing. Yeah, you're going to be on YouTube. You're going to be looked at and judged by hundreds of thousands of people. <laughs> Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, having it safe time and plotting is like one of the key reasons I learned how to do objects in Python. The other one was I was running um, some data analysis on a calibration tool on DKIST and we had reams, reams of data. We had 4,060 lines of spectral data that had been taken over the course of months across three spectrometers. And we had to like use sci-fi minimize to derive the closest ideal optic to like what we measured. So we had to like physically, we had to like model objects that were lenses and model objects that were packets of light with um, uh, Stokes vectors. And we had to like pass the Stokes vectors to the Mueller matrices of the objects of the, of the object of the lens objects and then rotate those lens objects it was really fun and we got really good results and they're published now. Um, you can look at the paper later, but I was very proud to have been part of that effort. And that's how I learned objects in Python was we had to recreate a physical experiment to model the data so that sci-fi minimize could run the model to try and predict the outcome. Yeah, if you're going to join paragliding, uh, RMHPA, Rocky Mountain Hang Gliding and Paragliding Association for Colorado, and then there's lots of other ones in other states. Um, we got a telegram, we've got reasonable dues, and we have insured sites. If you need to learn, contact Misha at Redtail Paragliding. <laughs> He's who I learned from, so like, I'm not getting sponsored or anything, and this isn't an official endorsement, but that's just like, I'm still alive, so there's that. Uh, is a tool of Jupyter extension available that measures performance of a notebook, timing information? Uh, you can use the time dot performance counter uh, object uh, methods to pull the time from a high resolution clock on your machine and compare it. Um, but I don't know of a Jupyter extension that does that for you. I know there's like implicit time it functions and stuff like that, but I'm not the person to ask about performance testing on Python. Python. If you're making performant code happen, like switch to Java, it's gonna be it's gonna save your life. <laughs> if you need things to go really fast, don't use Python. <laughs> Python's all right, but it's not. Um, there's a reason people don't run don't run benchmarks against Python, at least not too frequently. Um, if I up, if I update a new you uncome with the block right it's method you just need to see if how it yes it will make a new NCF file in your local repository so you'll be fine you can update it all you want now yeah and it, so basically we've we've gone two hours roughly since I pulled the data so you re-update it you'll get probably two more hours in the future and you lose two hours in the past whenever the model gets published the model doesn't run in uniform time but it generally takes about an hour and a half from like kickoff to finish. So um, I'm usually getting data that contains the hour I'm looking at the data in, but that doesn't bother me. I can actually compare the quality of the, the data that went into the model by looking at my window and saying what the model said was gonna be happening at whatever time. <laughs> and if they agree, then I'm like, okay, I can look another hour into the future with reasonable confidence. No one has taken me up on the offer of sharing their uh, their local predictions. 
kind of want to see what the Santa Barbara coast looks like this time of year. I've heard wonderful things. And if anyone's out near Monroe, Utah, I really want to see Monroe, Utah. Point of the mountain would be cool too. I can't think of any like good paragliding places on the East Coast. I guess there's some cliffs up in like um, upstate New York and Maine that are decent, the sea cliffs there. If you get enough of a sea breeze, maybe late summer. Yeah, um, I think that's the end of the lecture though. We're past two o'clock. If you gotta go, you gotta go. Uh, I'll, I'll stick around if people are, are still running their local examples and stuff because I don't really have any immediate things on my calendar right now. So if you want to stick around for a few, a few minutes and like ask me questions if you're having trouble running it locally, do so. Otherwise, thanks for attending. Um, good luck using the things you've learned today. Uh, yeah, so Daniel Marsh, when you create the plot, all you need to do is, let me just scroll down to my wind, my um, cloud model. Um, all you have to do is set streamlines to true. And that'll turn on streamlines. I'm also going to turn off barbs because I don't want to have barbs and streamlines at the same time. Um, so I'm going to do that here. And then I can just rerun this. Hang on. SO is not defined. Oh, that's a typo. I've got a type in my data. So in my plotting tool, I've got a plotting error here where I accidentally hit S probably because I was like trying to do something else. Uh, Austin, um, can you share your screen again? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, forgot that I wasn't in fact doing that. So my screen is now shared. There was a typo in the streamlines. Um, I don't typically use streamlines because they take a while to calculate and they slow down the production of the plots. They don't do me a whole lot of good because I want to see the, the, the bar before every, every two kilometers square but streamlines will calculate across the entire field. Um, and there was, a, there was a typo here. The wind time index had an S in front of the zero, um, probably because I just hit an S key while I was copy or pasting or something. I didn't realize where my cursor was at. Um, so that typo has been fixed. And then you just um, run the plot. I set, you have to turn streamlines on by setting streamlines to true and you turn barbs off by setting barbs to false. And then you should be able to um, load the object again, create the new object, and to just run down your um, your file to make sure that you create the object HR and call update on HR. And then you'll be able to get streamlines without barbs by setting streamlines on and barbs off. And then you can get this plot that has streamlines that shows you where the wind would be going. Um, for a lot of this area, the wind is very, very light. So the streamlines don't mean anything today, which is why the barbs are more useful because they actually give you wind velocity information. Um, and the streamlines just kind of give you like this packet of air came from Greeley, so it's gonna smell like cows, but like that's not useful information for me generally. Yeah, so um, scroll up Daniel and you'll find that in the, the line here, if streamlines act stream plot, um, NC wind V, NC wind time index, that should be zero, not S zero. That was just a typo that happened because I didn't realize where my cursor was and I probably hit a key. Um, happens to me all the time, <laughs> way too frequently. But now you should be able to get streamlines in your plots. Um, I don't personally prefer them, but I know people who like them, so I included them. There are some people who firmly believe in streamlines. I'm, I am not one of them because um, like this plot has massive gaps where there's just no streamlines plotted and there's not a whole lot I can do about it. So I have no wind data for that location. Cool. Uh, Jaizu, can you, can you share that? I'll stop sharing my screen and um, Julia can make you a co-presenter and you can show us the Seattle forecast. I sure, I can do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, let me see, how can I share screen? Um, very bottom of your Zoom window, you'll see a share screen okay. option. It's bright green if you're a co-host. Um, I don't think I can seeing. share right now. You are a co-host now, you can share now. Okay. Uh.
So, okay, so I have some sharing permit issue. Uh, so I have to quit, <laughs> yeah, quit Zoom that, and then reopen. So sorry about that. Bit. No, that's fine. That That's completely okay. I'm on a Mac myself. So I understand the sharing permissions can be, can catch you off guard. We make yeah, sure to run a practice right. talk before everything to make sure that everyone else that's like actually intended to present doesn't have exactly that issue. Yeah, but it's pretty cool that I can get the up-to-date forecast and then, you know, right. plot the current location. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. Thanks. Now, now, now you'll be the weather person for your office and all your friends are going to come <laughs> to be like, hey, is it going to be good to walk my dog this evening? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's pretty cool. Right. I think that about wraps it up. No yeah. one else is saying that they've got forecast. Oh. Yeah, Austin, sorry. This is Supreet. So I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any effort to paralyze this uh, to include a larger area? Um, I mean, you could very easily do that by, so I, I've run this, I've pulled the data set for the entire continental US. Okay. It is large. And when I say large, I'm using a capital L. It's like three gigabytes. Mm. It takes a while to pull. And then it takes a lot of memory to load and it takes forever to plot. Um, even using the fast um, mesh grid option for creating the, the, the color on your plots, even using the P color fast, the fast version of P color, it's very slow. It is, it is hours per plot um, on, on a human machine. It's not really worth it. But okay. yes, I, I've plotted like elevation data across the US from this data set to see what it would do. Okay, uh, I have another question. So uh, in, in C and Proton, we have the preprocessor directive where we define something. Uh, based on that, we select something in the code. Uh, can we, uh, like, uh, how, how do we create uh, an option like that in Python? Uh, when we create that option in Python, how do we start it? I mean, do we... I've never used preprocessor directives in Python. I know that there are Python libraries. I have tried. I have really tried using Python speed libraries. I've looked into them several times. I've not yet found one that works. Usually you use a decorator on a function or a decorator on a class to tell the just-in-time compiler in Python to preprocess it. All right. Uh, in C and Fortran, we, we send it as a make option. Uh, so in the make file, we define, you know. Uh, yes, Python, since it's just in time compiled, doesn't have make files. You have to supply the information about a function as a decorator. Um, uh, I don't think we've covered decorators, but you probably know what they are. It's like at something, yeah, yeah. then you provide some arguments. Um, and that's how you tell whatever packages are in that Python environment, before you even bother loading this into memory, this is what you need to do with it. Um, and there are, there are some code bundles out there that promise, hey, this, this um, decorator for your functions will you know, pre-compile it for your GPU or something. I've looked into a lot of them that make really grand promises about their revolutionary, this speeds up Python and makes Python actually fast for real this time kind of arguments and they've all never panned out. Arguably, I'm trying to do things more complex than their examples. Um, I'm trying to do actual science to them. Okay. Um, but like their examples are like, hey, look, we're, we're, we're generating the Fibonacci sequence or we're doing the prime number solve. And that's great that it works for them. But when I try to actually do work using their preprocessor directives, it almost always ends in tears or just wasted time. Okay, that makes sense, thank you. But if you come across anything that actually works as a preprocessor directive or a decorator for a Python class or a uh, function, let me know. I do look into those every few months when I get frustrated with having to do things in Fortran. But and <laughs> at this point, I'm just looking at making Julia the back end to everything. Yeah, yeah, thank you. That's yeah. Julia the language, not Julia Kent, my co-host. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to make her do everything. Please don't. <laughs> Okay, thanks, Austin. Thank you, everyone who attended and is still on the call. Uh, if you have any other questions, uh, please reach out. Um, and this will be posted on YouTube shortly. Thanks, Austin.
You're welcome. This time I didn't leak any personal information, so we can post it right away. <laughs> All right. Bye, everyone.